nothing I like better than a good campaign finance breakfast. And uh, you, you spoke. A lot of the talk is about super PACs, dark money, obviously a big topic this year in the national election. Uh, in terms of super PACs, you were talking about percentages uh, being kind of low in terms of the actual contributions. Uh, can you kind of expand on that? Well, what I was commenting on is that uh, the dark money that people talk about is actually a very, very small percentage of total political spending. Uh, it was about a little, about four and a half percent in 2012, about three and a half percent in 2014, and so far through the 2016 cycle, it's been under three um, percent. You're talking about contributions where you don't know who's sending it. That's right. Although that's a little bit of a misnomer as well. Typically dark money, we often do know who's spending it. For example, if the Chamber of Commerce spends it, people pretty much know who the Chamber of Commerce is. In fact, we always know who spends it in, in, at some level. What we don't always know is who gave it to the group that then spent it. Uh, but when we talk about a group such as like uh, one of the big soft money spenders in recent years has been the National Association of Realtors, another has been the Chamber of Commerce. When we talk about groups like that, I don't think voters are particularly fooled or puzzled by the agenda of the group. So when you, when you start by realizing that dark money is only about 3 or 4% of spending, and then we recognize that that includes money spent by organizations organizations that are very well known and they're the biggest spenders. I just try to emphasize to policymakers that we shouldn't let the dark money tail wag the dog. Dark money. If you want to energize people for reform, you need to scare people and dark money sounds scary. It's not new, by the way, either. We had dark money in the 90s. Social welfare groups have always been able to do this. And I find it very puzzling that people would say in a democracy, one thing that does not count as social welfare is political and electoral activity. That is not social welfare. No, sir. Right? I got a big, big laugh out of uh, one of our congressmen from California made, made a point of noting that these groups are supposed to be doing social welfare things that benefit the public, not engaging in politics. I'm like, you're an elected representative. Your career is politics, right? And you're saying these people are supposed to be doing things that benefit society, okay? So this is a benefit. There are reasons that make it very, very hard to try to force disclosure of absolutely every penny that's spent. And just as we would not want to put a police officer every 50 yards on every street to make sure we had no crime, right? There's cost benefit here, and, and there are costs to disclosure. Uh, the academic research clearly shows that people are less likely to contribute if they know their contribution is going to be disclosed. Sometimes some of this disclosure can actually be misleading. If we want to know who gave to the chamber, what if somebody gave to the chamber 18 months before? And of course they have no say in once, how the chamber then spends the money. They might have even opposed it. So you have these kinds of problems and that makes us suggest that we should be careful about getting all worked up about this problem. We should keep it in perspective and we need to uh, have careful, thoughtful solutions. Uh, in terms of dark money though, mo I get what you're saying about the chamber and people, we know usually how they spend their money, who they spend right. to, but I think most people are talking about these huge sums of money candidates get and you just don't know where it's coming from. Um, do you, you're saying in, in general it's a small percentage, but do you see in, the, in terms of the federal uh, elections and even on the state level, uh, do you see this as an issue if candidates are on one end talking about I'm fighting for the middle class, I'm fighting for this, but then you don't know where they're getting huge sums of money from? Because to a working class person, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations is quite a few pennies. Well, there's two things here uh, at play. First, of course, is the candidates don't get the money directly. In other words, candidates have to disclose pretty much everything other than de minimis contributions. For example, at the federal level, it's, it's anything over $200. In some states, it's as little as like $10 that they have to disclose. So what we're talking about is money that is spent independently of the candidates. Now, that certainly can be beneficial to candidates, but it's a little bit different than the candidate actually controlling the money. And I do think that is not... A, You're talking about the super PACs? I'm talking about super PACs and 501c4s that spend money. Super PACs, remember, disclose all of their donors. So what we're really talking about is this group of, of what are called in the tax code, social welfare organizations. And these are groups like, and also trade associations. So it's trade associations like the Chamber of the Realtors who I've mentioned, but it's also then uh, public interest groups like the Sierra Club, like Planned Parenthood. Uh, they have a C4 and a C3 arm, different arms. Uh, it's like the NAACP, it's like Right to Life. These are the kinds of groups that we're talking about. Now, it is true that now and then, you know, one will spring up that people don't really know much about, might have been formed shortly before the election. But, but really, again, that's a very small percentage of the total. And 
when we think about what should be done about that, we have to be careful not to stamp out the broader political activity. Most Americans belong to these kinds of groups or at least sympathize with these kinds of groups, right? We sympathize with the NRA or with Handgun Control Inc., both of which have been uh, spenders and would be, in theory, quote, dark money groups. And we don't want, I think, to do things that uh, push those groups out of the political system. Um, in terms of uh, the super PACs and money in politics, uh, it kind of went, Obama in 2008 had a huge, a very inspiring message. It wasn't really focused on that he took a lot of Wall Street money and super PAC money. 2012, same thing. It's really come into the spotlight now. Maybe it took a few years after Citizens United. Uh, you saw Bernie Sanders, obviously. Donald Trump has kind of had this populist tone. At first, he didn't take any super PAC money. Now he is. Um, do you see why uh, this this populist outcry, uh, feeling that on you know, the rhetoric doesn't match? You know, on one end, candidates will talk about I'm going to go after Wall Street or the o big oil companies, and then they have fundraisers that night with the same people. Uh, not I'm not talking about the percentages, just right. the optics. Sure. No, I, no, I think that's very true. Now, but let me point out one thing. For example, you mentioned Obama in 2008, 2012. But of course, in 2008, he didn't take super PAC money because in 2008, super PACs were still illegal federally. It was not until the 2012 that, it, that the courts had said that people had a right to do this. And I mentioned that to show that the problem just isn't so easy, right? That that we've always had this problem. I mean, the reality is that people need money to run a campaign, and they need to raise that money from somewhere. And when they do, that means people who could give money will have more to spend. Uh, and <clears throat> that is, I think, naturally uh, troubling to people. And it can be very troubling, in fact. But it can also be very good, in fact. For example, I think most people, you know, a lot of people, for example, who favor green energy and so on, aren't really that disturbed if Tom Steyer goes and spends a lot of money to promote green energy candidates. Explain who Tom Steyer is. Uh, Tom Steyer is a, is a wealthy billionaire who has spent uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, supporting uh, essentially Democratic and liberal candidates primarily on a green agenda, right? And I don't think people then are going like, darn that Tom Steyer, you know? I mean, there are, but those are the conservatives. And you have the flip side with other issues, people like the Kochs, who are better known, right? And they're, they're a big bugaboo for, for liberals. The reality... We're about for conservatives. Uh, yeah, but... but but the, the point is that in, in the big picture is, I, I do understand that, and I, and I think there's some logic to it, but in the end, a lot of these big donors are speaking for lots and lots of people. I mean, let's go back some in history. Maybe people remember, but in the 1990s, Ross Perot spent tens of millions of dollars of his own money to run for president. In those days, he had to run. He had to be the candidate in order to do it. Now he could fund the super PAC, right? Ross Perot didn't drown anybody out. He didn't keep anybody from being heard. He actually gave voice to millions of Americans who thought the deficit was a huge issue, and that was Ross Perot's big issue. And he felt that neither of the major parties were dealing with it. So did he drown people out? Did he make the system less responsive? I think he probably made the system more responsive. I think his campaigns probably contributed to the impetus that gave us balanced budgets in the late 1990s. And he, he gave voice to people, right? And he didn't suppress people's voices. And I think that's the important thing. We want a system in which it, lots and lots of people can play. And we need to recognize as much as it, it, it kind of sticks in our craw, right? It, this is not a homeroom election. This is an election in a country with 300 million people. It's going to cost money. And the people who fund those campaigns usually are speaking for lots of people other than themselves. Yeah, I'd have to disagree, unfortunately. I think uh, they're speaking for lots of people that are powerful and uh, wealthier. I could give you examples all over the country. We've been around for the last eight months of young people coming up to me. We covered Bernie Sanders a lot, millennial uh, supporters uh, actually running in local areas, begging me for an interview because they just don't have the money to compete because they are, you know, right out of college or mid twenties or whatever, and they can't compete with the establishment candidate with tons of money. So that is the system we have on a local and state level, how do you, how is that system good in terms of anybody could, could run for office? One of the things we see is since we started regulating campaign finance and limiting contributions, and remember up to the 1970s, person, the idea that you could limit what a person gave to campaign was unheard of. Anybody could give whatever they want. And they did. Historically, that's how we funded campaigns. And what you find is that that's what get campaigns off the ground. If you're an unheard of person, 
You can't go out and raise lots of money in small contributions. Why? Because nobody's ever heard of you. If you have sort of an unpopular idea that you think could become popular, you can't raise lots of money in small contributions. Why? Because your idea is contrary to the status quo. It's against the grain. People aren't familiar with it. You need a sort of a venture capitalist who will come in and get your campaign up and running. And to give an example, the last presidential campaign we had before passage of the Federal Election Campaign Act was 1968. In that race, Gene McCarthy felt that none of the major candidates at the time, uh, Johnson, the incumbent president, and uh, the major Republican candidates, Nixon, of course, got the nomination, there were others, but he felt that they were not sufficiently representing an anti-war position. He launched his campaign in December before the New Hampshire primary, right? In December of what would be 1967. Could you imagine launching a presidential campaign now in December of 2015? Mm -hmm. You know, you could never do it. Why could he do it? Because a bunch of wealthy millionaires gave him large campaign contributions, amounts that would be five or $10 million today. Stuart Mott, who was an heir to the General Motors fortune, uh, the Dreyfus family, which were Wall Street investors. These people gave him large sums of money and that enabled his campaign to get up and running almost immediately. So that's a classic example before we had federal campaign finance laws where under the current laws, there would have been no anti-war campaign. J Lyndon Johnson would not have been knocked out of that race. McCarthy knocked him out of the race. Now, maybe in the end it didn't matter because we ended up electing Nixon, right? But, but clearly it's an example of where the ability to raise money quickly from large donors represents lots of people and represents an idea that is anti-establishment. Right, but what I'm asking is, isn't that kind of an argument for public financing? Because uh, most, pe most people, common sense would think, uh, very wealthy people are not giving money out of the kindness of their heart. They're wealthy because they're good businessmen or whatever the point is, they're expecting something in return. Most people don't give money for no reason. No, actually, m people do give money for no reason. It's interesting. I hear that comment made all the time by people who are attending you know, college on the, you know, Joseph A. Bank Scholarship Fund or something like that. Who is this guy? Why is this guy funding their education, right? Because people do do these things. They endow hospitals and symphonies and all kinds of things. Now, maybe they want their name on it. Maybe they want some, But they're not doing this to make money. You know, people do have an altruistic bone and a lot, most big donors actually want what's best for the country. That really is, you know, what they want to see done. If you have a public financing system, here's the problem you're going to have. All those young people you mentioned, right? Well, who's going to give them money? If, if the government is going to start giving money to everybody who just says, I want to be a state rep, and they get a bunch of money from the government, I think you're going to find that there's not going to be much popular support for that. People don't want to fund the campaigns of Lyndon LaRouche or David Duke or, you know, people who they think is, are nut jobs or appalling people. How would you like it if you had to be funding the campaign of Donald Trump, right? You, you could be funding the campaign of Donald Trump, and you might hate everything he stands for, and your tax dollars are funding him. And that will, so, so the public systems will tend not to support uh, especially new candidates, candidates with new odd ideas, different ideas, candidates with exciting ideas, right? The public system enforces the status quo. What those candidates need is somebody to come up and challenge the status quo, and that's where you need a venture capitalist, and that's how it works. But what you're saying, basically, uh, is to really change the system, it's not really about, if you're, uh, if you're a 20-year-old Bernie Sanders type, who wants to run somewhere. Uh, it's not just your ideas, you need to convince a millionaire to fund you. Well, it's, it's first, it's, I would say, uh, it's actually much easier to convince a millionaire to fund you than to convince uh, 100,000 people to each give you $10, right? So if you want to get your campaign up and running, it's a better system if he can give you a million. All you got to just find one guy. Bernie Sanders just but, challenged that, though, didn't well, he? But, but Bernie Sanders was already a U.S. senator, well-known, right, uh, with a big constituency. And that raises another important point. To some extent, right, Americans generally don't elect 20-year-olds to high office. This is not a slant at 20 years. I was a 20-year-old, right? I was ambitious and eager. The fact is Americans, by and large, are looking for people who have proven themselves, shown that they can be successful in one way or another. And, of course, we do actually have at the federal level actual age constraints in the Constitution on how old you have to be. So, you know, I remember, uh, you know, not long ago a young man was talking to me and he wanted to run for state rep. And I said, why would anybody vote for you? Have they heard of you? Have you done anything? And he had great ideas, and he did. I think he was a really promising young guy. But I said, you, you've got to spend some time in your community, building up your name, letting people know what an intelligent, sharp guy you are, right? You can't just go out and run and expect it to be there. If you are successful, though, if you do that, usually you can raise money. It's, it's very hard to find cases of people who actually could be elected who could not raise any money 
to run. You know, usually the same tr attributes that allow you to raise money are the kind of things that get you voted the ballot. So let's fast forward then, uh, not just how you get elected, but do you think once these people get elected, back on the backs of a lot of uh, high, high dollar donors, special interest, that they are not then beholden in many ways? I mean, but you have Barney Frank, Hillary Clinton, uh, candidates on both, even Donald Trump saying, uh, you know, it doesn't affect me. I, it gives me their, it allows uh, them to have my ear, but it doesn't affect me. I mean, common sense would dictate that it's not always true. Well, sh surely it matters at some level. And I think the politicians themselves don't even know the extent to which it matters or how much it matters, right? They got a million things. But think about who they talk to most of the time. Most of the time, the, you know what the single most common occupational category is of people who testify at, at hearings for ch legislative bills? It's government employees, right? And they're surrounded by staff who are government employees. And they talk to their spouse and people. In other words, basically, about the only time they don't talk to people who are working for the government is the fact that they have to raise money, they have to relate to constituents in that way. You know, they get out and talk. So, so there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, stories, just, stories came out recently, though, that ca congressmen are spending you know, almost half their week, more than half their week, in a separate room uh, calling for money. They, they, they do, and that's, that's a self-inflicted wound because they can't go and ask somebody. They can't go and just say to somebody, you know, you know me, you know what I vote for, you agree with me, give $500,000 to my campaign. They can't do that. Instead, they got to spend the day calling to thousands of people to get, what would it be, a couple hundred, a couple thousand of them to give them, you know, the much smaller amounts that they can get. So that's a self-inflicted wound. Isn't that kind of a, kind of a sad state of our, our system? though because the, the, how do you connect with your constituents and what's going on if half the time you're you're not talking to working class people struggling well again let's do away with the thing that makes them spend all that time so they can get out you know on the hustings right Let, they can get out I, I always go back to this idea that if we consider the fact that prior to the 1970s we didn't have this regulation and people then you know seem to think our democracy worked better that's when we passed the voting rights act that's when we defeated the nazis you know that's when we established social security and medicare and all these programs that are so much a part of our fabric now people used to think congress worked so i say at some point you just got to look at the results and and think about you know whether this idea of regulating everybody is working and I think the, the pretty clear answer is no and I think then we have to start thinking well why is that how is it that money actually works in politics is it actually better for people to fund their campaign with lots of small dollar donations like say Barry Goldwater and George Wallace did or is it better if they fund their campaigns much more easily by by getting some big dollars and then going out to the voters and saying what do you think you know the way that Theodore Roosevelt funded his campaigns right um, I, I think we need to realize, in other words, that there's no perfect answer to this particular problem, right? Democracy is a messy, ugly sort of thing. But in the end, the regulation has not worked well, and in fact, it has been, I think, demonstrably harmful to public participation, to public confidence in government, and it has probably done a lot more to shape our policy preferences in a negative way than if we than if we did not have the regulation because it hems the candidates in. They have to go to Wall Street and ask because they got to get lots and lots of people to give them money. That means you got to go to where there's lots and lots of people with money as opposed to, again, getting that one or two venture capitalists. Think about it if you're a 20-year-old and you have a great idea for a business, right? And the government had a law that said nobody can give you more than $2,500 for your business. You probably couldn't get your business off the ground. But if somebody could give you a lot of money, you, you could make the round. And, and all you had to do would get one person to believe in you and that would give you the money to start up and then you could go take your product to market and see what consumers think. Politics works much the same. You've got to get your product to market and let the voters decide. Good segue to my last question. Uh, I wasn't born yet, but I would argue before the 1970s, the main difference was you didn't have the explosion of the lobbying industry. I mean, there was lobbying here and there, but I mean... You have lobbyists now as super delegates for candidates. You have lobbyists on TV acting as impartial uh, pundits, but they're lobbyists. Um, you have lobbyists uh, bundling money. Um, Hillary Clinton, uh, Jeb Bush, they had lobbyists bundling hundreds of thousands of dollars for them. Um, how is, in terms of declare, this is transparent. We know what these people's interests are. Uh, how is it that that's not toxic in terms of 
having, can, having candidates beholden to special interests. I think it's an interesting point, and I, I think there are two responses. First is one of the things I think that lobbying is much more influential and, and, and does much more. You know, lobbyists get to go in and sit down and talk to the person flat out. Now, lobbying isn't all bad, remember, right? Let's suppose you represent the largest employer in the state, so it's a big company. It would almost be legislative malpractice for the state senator to say, I refuse to talk to the biggest employer in my state and see what they need, you know? That's not going to happen. But at the same time, I think lobbying is a much bigger issue for those who are worried about influence than is something like campaign finance. And the other point that needs to be raised here is that it, at some level, all of this is a natural result of having big government. When you've got a government that can give subsidies to green companies and that can deny people other things and that can put tariffs on certain things and, you know, that regulates, claims the right to regulate essentially every part of your life, that can regulate, you know, uh, regulates your bathrooms and it regulates who you can live with and it regulates the number of fire extinguishers you have to have in your workplace and it regulates everything and claims the right to regulate everything, you are naturally going to have people that want to spend money to affect that. So if we really want to eventually cut out the power of special interest, it really does involve at some level getting government spending and government regulation or control. And there's just no nice way around that. Uh, if you want big government, and there are many good things for, come from big government, you are going to have lobbyists and you're going to have special interest influence. And you, and you have to decide, do I want to intrude on our First Amendment rights? Do I want to intrude on the flexibility of the system? Do I want to limit people's speech, right, in order to try to get rid of that influence? I maintain you won't get rid of that influence, but you will get rid of people's free speech. So ultimately, that's kind of one of the trade-offs you have to make for big government. Big government can do lots of nice things for you, but it has a cost, and that cost is not just in dollars. It is in, is in freedoms, and it is in the uh, desire of people and therefore the ability of people to get control of that government and use it for their own ends and use that power perhaps against your interest. Uh, maybe I'm an idealist because I think if you have uh, big government candidates, nobody would argue Bernie Sanders is one of those, uh, Tim Canova who believe in government as a tool uh, to you know, affect economic and social good, uh, whose main pillars are, are changing that system of you know, uh, corporate influence, lobbyists. I mean, if you have enough of those, I, you might be able to start seeing cracks in the armor. It's it's a huge armor, as, as we've talked about. But um, I think it's also about the nature of who these politicians are. You mentioned young people are, you, you mentioned young people don't have a resume. Uh, a lot of people would say that's actually could be uh, a positive because they're, they're untainted versus establishment politicians. But that's the other key point that I make, essentially, right? The other thing is, in the end, we as voters are the ones who have the power. You win by getting votes, not by stuffing dollars in a ballot box. And ultimately, you know, we choose who to send. We choose who to send up there, and we tell them what we want them to do, right? And if we tell them, I want you to make my college tuition free, you have to understand that somebody else is going to be telling them, I want you to use that same power to guarantee loans that I make to these students so that if I, I don't have any risk of going bankrupt if I make bad loans, right? In other words, if you give government that power again, you can't be assured that it's going to work in your advantage. But to the extent we're concerned about corruption of government, the biggest solution beyond, I think, limiting government is electing good people, people with integrity, you know? And, I mean, what do you say? The Democratic Party chose to nominate Hillary Clinton. So uh, Democrats are not very well positioned now to say we want people with integrity in government and we need to stop this. We need to prevent other people from speaking about candidates. And, and think the same thing with Donald Trump. If you really believe, as so many do, that Donald Trump would just be an absolute disaster for the United States, how can you say that a millionaire, a multimillionaire, should not be able to spend a large sum of money to try to defeat that person. Isn't it a moral imperative to do that? And so that's why I think that these issues are, you know, they're very complex, they're very difficult, but in the end, we all benefit from a system that allows people to speak freely, that allows them to use whatever resources are available to them, whether it's fame, whether it's the ability to put on a free concert or the value of their endorsement, or whether it's just their ability to be effective community organizers or whatever, and for some people, it's their ability to contribute money that someone else can use to do those tactics. I think that's what's best. And uh, one of your colleagues here had told me uh, the FEC is really the failure to enforce commission. Uh, do you agree with that? I think that uh, this is a long-standing critique that is made by the sort of campaign finance regulatory advocates. And here's the thing. Of course it's not the failure to enforce commission. That is 
go and write a check for Bernie Sanders for $5,000 and see what happens to you, right? Um, go and, you know, openly coordinate your activities with a candidate and see what happens to you. You can't do that because the FEC enforces this stuff all the time. What they mean by failure to enforce commission is that there are areas of the law that are very gray and that are very difficult because they do involve our core rights to free speech, our core First Amendment rights with the countervailing values of equality and, and preventing corruption, right? And the law is a gray area and they're tough decisions to make and sometimes they lose those decisions, right? They lose and so they say, well, they're just failing to enforce the law. But in fact, the reality I think more is that the law is not clear and maybe even the law is against them because people have other values than merely regulating money and politics in that way. So I think it's a, it's a misnomer. You know, clearly there is a heavy regulatory layer on American politics now. We have more regulation of campaign finance than any time in our history. Does it work? I don't think so. Thanks so much. I appreciate the conversation.